advocacy has been such an important part because I feel like the work that I'm doing, like advocacy is a top priority. Without it, Broke is just another fashion brand. And that's not what it is. It's a lifestyle. Broke is a lifestyle. It's an ethical, it's an idealistic lifestyle that I want to communicate with people and share with people. I mean, encourage people to like, you know, jump on the wagon for it, which is what excites me a lot about Broke as well, that it's just not about a garment. It's about you're right. Like it's about so many aspects of my childhood. And essentially, that's what I want to pass on. That's the legacy that I want to share with the people stuff that I have experienced. And I feel like there's so many other people out there who have had similar experiences or are going through something similar. And it's just being able to like identify with one another and relate and uh, be able to create that inclusive environment and work together and like unite through sharing garments. I look at it as a very beautiful way of exchange. Hello everyone, my name is Dean Long and welcome to the podcast Lifeline. In this podcast, I will interview people who are having a positive impact in their community and have a strong message that deserves to be shared. We will dive deeper into their journey becoming a change maker and hopefully you can take away some insights for your own journey. And please do subscribe to Lifeline on YouTube, Apple Podcasts or any platform that you are using. And also you can share this episode with your friends if you like it. It's really what helps me the most. In today's episode, you will meet Mahena Shaudhuri, who is a sustainable fashion, zero race and gender activist on a mission to break stereotypes and build a slow fashion movement in Bangladesh. She founded Broke, the first upcycled fashion label and textile recycling innovation lab of Bangladesh and is the ambassador of Slow Fashion Bangladesh. She's fighting every day to reduce the water impact of the fashion industry, to make fast fashion companies accountable and to encourage citizens to transition to slow fashion. She also launched Broke to break the stereotypes when it comes to gender by designing gender-neutral clothes and by empowering people to celebrate the difference. As she always says, Broke is not a brand, it's a lifestyle. She shares how she grew up in an artistic environment, worked in human resources department for a few years before starting her slow fashion advocacy through Broke, articles, exhibitions, and workshops throughout Bangladesh. Enjoy this episode and see you in two hours. Hello, assalamu alaikum, mahena zapu, and Hi. Mubarak. Hey, <laughs> Mubarak. Yes, I, you know, yeah, after speaking to all the Bangladeshi, now I start to grab some words. So it's always a good That's so sweet. Good icebreaker. <laughs> Um, but yeah, no, I'm super, super excited to have you, Mahenas, on Lifeline podcast. Uh, I discovered you not so long ago through Linka. Uh, she's the one who <laughs> makes me discover a lot of uh, guests of Lifeline. Um, but yeah, I always start by reminding a bit how I know my guests. But in your case, um, yeah, Linka, actually recently Linka is really into climate change. So she keeps speaking about Broke. Uh, so yeah, so I was like stalking a bit the website and then we had this, yeah, we had this opportunity to invite you for a panel discussion. And then maybe for everyone who's listening, I think during the panel, when every time Mahenas was sharing, the chat was so crazy and yeah, so many people were like, okay, let's start this fan club of Mahenas. (laughs) Who will start the Facebook page? Blah 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 blah. So yeah, I hope I hope everyone who listens will also <laughs> join the fan club of uh, Mahena. That's um, so sweet. Too. <laughs> but yeah, no, maybe before everything, uh, would you like to introduce yourself? Who you are? What are you doing these days? Or just anything you want to share to kickstart? Sure. Um, thank you so much, uh, for having me on your show, on your podcast. Um, and uh, it's been an exciting opportunity ever since we got connected to like speak to such a wonderful crowd to talk about time and change and what, what we can do. So I am Mahina Chaudhry and I am a zero waste designer and a sustainability scientist in Bangladesh. I have my own sustainable brand label called Broke. And what I do there is I collect secondhand clothes 
and vintage. And I'm doing advocacy in Bangladesh to aware people about the importance of re-wearing their clothes instead of buying new. And in the process, I, I basically work with garment factories and stuff to like make sure that their wastes are not thrown away or like burnt down so we can find a salvage value uh, and ways to like salvage it, basically. Um, currently, now I'm just focusing on like building this brand, um, making it as relevant as possible within the local perimeter and also scale it up in the international market. So we're trying to see like how that can work. There's a lot of research, academic, business, and economic activities that are going on in the back end. So I feel um, even despite the pandemic, um, I'm trying to make use of that time because right now the productions are our. Um, so yeah, we're trying to make the most of it. Um, and it's been eat uh, over the last two days. So it's been nice to like kind of get out because the lockdowns are done. For like we start the lockdown again tomorrow, so today's the last day we can like get out and like meet people. So it's been nice. So that's what we've been doing of all, all the last two days. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm really excited to like have this conversation with you. Thank you. Well, so cool, Mahenas. I think. Um, so yeah, basically in this episode today, I want to speak about so many things. One thing I didn't mention is I really stalk you. I stalk all the guests, but I stalk you a lot. I went to all the links in your link tree. <laughs> um, so yeah, I read all your articles with great institute. Um, so yeah, very interesting. I learned a lot about uh, the slow fashion movement in Bangladesh. And maybe, yeah, I think definitely we'll speak about this. I want to speak as well about... I mean, basically all your life. But I think what I found interesting is that you, know, you studied HR, then you worked a lot in HR, then you had a sort of switch, you know, uh, in uh, the zero waste movement and slow fashion movement. And one thing you mentioned last time in the panel, I also want to speak about greenwashing, one of my favorite topics. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I hope we can speak about uh, all of this today. Um, yeah. <laughs> Also, maybe just to kickstart, I, you know, uh, last time when I asked you for your title uh, to put under your picture, you know, I was expecting something like just, you know, oh, yeah. of brocade. And then you said you shared what you just said, <laughs> like sustainability scientist and zero waste designer. I was like, oh, well, that's cool. <laughs> could you could you <laughs> explain a bit about it? Like first, sure. like what did it mean and how did you came up with this? Sure. Um, yeah, that, that's been exciting for me to like also like kind of narrow it down because, um, you know, you have to put your title in like in so many places, right? Um, I know that I am the founder of my brand, but I feel like more than that, what adds value and what makes more sense in terms of the work that I'm doing is, is the circularity of fashion. And with my work, like I do very, so after being a designer, like as I implement the zero waste principle. So I think that's my first identity. And I, 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 I own up to that identity more than the founder because, you know, anybody can find anything, whatever, like that's, that's fine. But like, I feel the work specifically that I am involved with is the designing aspect. Um, and with a sustainability scientist, um, it's so exciting because, um, having so studied like environmental science and management, like I get to work in terms of like the impact framework um, and like, you know, value chain mapping and stuff and like understanding like um, psychology of like consumption and like people and like how it works. So I feel like there's so much there that the sustainability scientist title itself, the responsibility that it carries adds so much weight. So I hold myself accountable to the work that needs to be done for the organization. Um, so it kind of like landed from there first, like I was, I was going by like the bureau with designer first, then I think it evolved once I graduated, like I, I, it evolved into the sustainability side as well. And I think paired together, it kind of said a lot about what my visions are with the brand and what I'm actually like being able to contribute to my brand as well. So that's, that's been, that's how it kind of like came about. And what would you add to your title, which is not related to like climate change? 
But you had to have yeah. it all for yourself, you know. When I'm not addressing myself as a brand owner, uh, I think I'm glow as an artist. <laughs> Own up to that. <laughs> Yeah, I think one thing I notice about you is you do a lot of stuff like from, I know you have your host exhibitions, you write a lot of articles. I saw a lot of videos as well. So I think, uh, yeah, so many things that you do. And I think, yeah, it's a great way, you know, your title, like founder of Brocade, yeah, still like, like super nice. But yeah, I think I agree with you. Like now it really narrows down a bit yeah. your mission while here we can see, okay. This is her life mission. This is what she can do, whether it's with Broke or not. Yeah. It's what she can do. Um, yeah. So, yeah, no, it's pretty cool. Um, Thank you. Before we dive deeper into Broke and everything, I'd love mm. to have the, the full picture of your journey. So, uh, but I saw that you spoke a lot um, about, you know, when you were younger, you were already, you no. Know, uh, culture of Bangladesh is to, you know, exchange uh, traditional clothing with, you know, your mother, yeah. grandmother. Would you take yeah. like the start of your, I don't know, zero waste or, you know, climate advocacy or you, you didn't really think that way when you were younger? Um, so when I was younger, none of these concepts were introduced to me or I was exposed to. So it was very new. Like, I had no idea, like, you know, that climate change was an issue back then, like when I was growing up. So this was like the early 90s, mid 2000s. Um, and then like uh, sustainability or like stuff like that were, were never discussed in that manner. So, but where I was coming from was more from the avenue of like a home practice of like, you know, sharing clothes, wearing my friend's clothes or like, you know, we're we exchanging our clothes instead of like buying something new. So it just came from that. So I would say like I was, I wasn't aware of these terms or like the issues at all in the scale that I am now um, over the last 10 years, right? Even like in the last five years, it's changed and evolved so much. Um, and I'm every day getting to learn like new concepts and new areas, um, new issues, new economic models that can be implemented. So it's really interesting. Um, how things were back then like and how informed or trying to be more informed now did you ever imagine that you would do that when you were younger like what you're doing right now Ooh. no i had no idea you know like I, for me um creating clothes was never a vision or if we think about just in terms of like the designing aspects of it like i've, I've i'm an artist so i've always thought about like in terms of like pen and paper like drawing stuff um, never thought I could connect the dots like this and let alone the environmental aspects. But I've always wanted to become an architect when I was a child. And then that was the main goal in my life. But then I did get into the architect department, architecture department, and then I switched to BBA. And then I graduated with like a double major in like marketing and HR. So the paths would not have crossed so easily, but like, it, no, it was never part of the plan. So you said, yeah, so from... If I understand well, from early age, we're already drawing a bit like have like, like artsy vibes. So this was already there, but not as, okay, I will be a you know, professional artist or at least maybe use some of the skills in architecture. Um, but then you switch to study HR. Like, can you, can you share a bit about this? <laughs> yeah. So like growing up, um, because I mean, for me, like, in order to still be able to like draw and professionally made more sense with architecture because that had a better career planning, more like people took it more seriously than if I just wanted to become an artist. Like, you know, I mean, in terms of like people around me or like my family members, like it's like, oh, what artist? What are you going to do with that? You know, so that's why like it was always architecture. It's like, all right, the only way I can draw as much as I want to draw would be through architecture. And then and then something happened. I think it was the fact that architecture is a five-year-long program, uh, whereas BBA was a four-year-long program. Um, I kind of switched. And uh, some of my friends were in BBA as well. So like it, was, it just made more sense that a child, I'll, I'll just switch. 
um, and like get into it. Also, like while I so, because I, apart from that, like also I want to study like international relationships and stuff. But like uh, the university that I went to did not offer that course at that time. Um, so, and my dad was played a very influential role in me picking HR as well, because he worked for the tea gardens, uh, for about 45 years. Now he's retired. Um, so growing up, I'd see like a lot of books that he had on like human resource management and like also seeing him very close at his workplace managing so many people, like over 5,000, 6,000 people at a time. Um, was very intriguing and like everybody loves him like he had a very strong work code work ethics um people respected him um his 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 management style was very unique and very very effective and that's something that really inspired me to take up hr and like make that move um i think it was that one book my dad had Right after I finished my A levels, before I started applying for like university, and it was on HR, human resource management, and like practices that I worked with. And I read that book like briefly, just like spring came through, and I was like, you know what? I think I can do that because I, the idea was to like kind of uh, mimic my dad as much as I could. Like you know, like every every child looks up to their parents and wants to become like them. And for me, the way I could become like my dad, the the kind of person that he was at his workplace was by studying HR. So that's why like I switched to BDA and I started pursuing HR. And um, I realized that, so I did a um, double major in marketing. So like, and marketing was just like an added year. So a lot of my friends were doing like HR and marketing. And I thought it was a really good combination because it, it just opened up a lot more avenues for me. Um, like I like branding more than like sales. So like that was very interesting, like going through that process. Um, and like all of these thoughts of like school of thought, like ha interlinks with each other a lot, like in terms of like HR, there's an employer branding at both on. So it was interesting to like implement that at like workplaces where I worked. So yeah, so I think that's how it kind of transitioned. <laughs> So like I see the HR part and the artist part, does it come from your mother? Oh, uh, very interesting oh. question, actually. Um, so my, my, uh, youngest aunt, my, my, my mom's youngest sister, basically, she, she was a brilliant artist, like not a professional artist, but like, she'd always draw like around me. Like, I don't, I grew up like watching her draw different stuff. And so it was always inspiring to like, I know have that around me. So that pushed me to like pursue, like, so I'd always doodle at home, like always, even if I have like a hundred degree fever, for me, my way of like coping with all of these things were just like to be able to like draw. So I had, so that was an avenue for me. Um, and I think it also comes from like my dad's side, like my, um, one of my uncles and uh, he, he's a brilliant artist as well. So like I've always seen his artworks growing up um, at my place and it was, it was very inspiring. So like, I think just, just being surrounded by so much art and like creativity, like amongst my family members was very cool. My grandmother that I grew up with, so we used to live in a joint family, like me growing up, like with my mom's parents and her sisters and her brother. So my nanu, my, my grandmother, who I call Nanu. She passed away like about in 2006. Um, so she, she was a brilliant lady, um, super creative. Like she was a poet. She published her own books. She's, she was a musician. She played the sitar. She played the guitar. She was an amazing singer back in the days, like during the seventies, um, in Pakistan. Um, and then like, and like she was a master cook. So like, even like when she was cooking and like, preparing the stuff like it looks so beautiful and artistic um everything that she did was like very very inspiring so i think i didn't even know like she's inspiring me in so many ways that i was so in awe of like everything that she did but i think it all, all adds up to why art was such a major major part of my life like growing up yeah it's very interesting to see like no this is a kind of environment where you grew up i just wondered 
you know, while you were studying HR, uh, oh. even worked in HR, like how, you know, how was it in front of <laughs> art in your world? Is it still there? Is it still, because just before you still wanted, you know, to, okay, what is the best way to work using my art passion? Uh, I just wondered if you still have this somewhere in your mind, you know, during your early 20s. Yeah, um, I think working in HR was fascinating. Like it was really, really cool. Um, I got very lucky in the organizations that I worked for, um, had brilliant mentors or my bosses that I worked for that practice like very innovative HR, not the traditional like administrative HR, which allowed me to kind of implement like different kind of freedom apps into the workplaces as well and it also allowed me to like pursue art like in my free time as well so I, I, I do a few projects here and there like mural work um, mural projects with like a friend here um, and that was interesting because these workplaces kind of helped me channel art as um as an avenue like it was it was it was good because HR was very aggressive like it was very hard working and with art at the back of my mind like I could use that to like express and like just like you know de-stress myself so it was always kind of there so I think like both of it just balanced each other out very well yeah it's also the picture in my mind like you know HR you know like very <laughs> yeah, what you said, you know, very straightforward, very... Yeah, very rigid. <laughs> very, very rigid. And at the same time, you are painting murals and stuff like this. Uh, so I think very interesting combination. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, maybe I think something interesting you said is, you know, you were, you had very good mentors, very good employers. Yeah. Like, what, 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 does, what, do, what do you mean when you say like innovative HR? Okay. Um, so what traditionally like HR over here turns into becoming like, you know, just policies, making sure people are just like following rules. If people are breaking rules, you penalize them. Um, you send out letters, you fire people, you hire people, you're going through that whole recruitment process. Uh, very administrative, very boring kind of work, right? So I got very lucky in the sense that where I worked with graphic people for four years. Um, that was one of the best places I, I would say, like uh, amongst all the other places that I worked, they were equally great. But like, I think graphic people like, connected better in terms of the bosses that I worked with directly. They allowed a lot of experimental work at their to, to like groom a culture. So I was mostly so I was doing so I was I was managing the culture, I was managing the talent, um, I was figuring out. Um, how to engage the employees better because like we had over 300 employees working at the same time so then you know like it was it was a crucial for the organization to make sure that the culture is retained um the important values are like instilled among the new people who are coming in and refreshed among the old people who are working so so that was very exciting for me to be able to do that create like employer blend branding programs, internal campaigns, internal engagement programs, a lot of surveys, um, sports and activities, because I'm a very athletic person like growing up. Like I don't I don't play sports anymore, but I used to like back in high school. Like in the football school team, uh, I was in the volleyball school team. So for me sports has been like very, very important. I mean I know like how it helps like bonding people and brings different teams together. So like uh, when I was working there, I made sure like we had like very regular like sports activities like throughout the year. Um, you know, we had like different kinds of sessions that I got to like organize with the people in order to like make sure we had more uh, better systems of like feedback um, an outlet channel for people to like talk about what they were thinking. Because the more people bottle things up is what I learned that the further they get away from the culture and the values and the management. So HR is essentially works as an advocate between the management and the employees so you're kind of you know you're like a messenger between both parties um and uh, that was very exciting for me because i had no because that those are the things that i wanted to do like i wanted to create new things like as an artist i think that's where the artistic side kind of come in like you're you're being creative about like how 
you solve problem, you know, um, how you look at things differently, like um, how you bring in like new things into into the new organization. Because the, the organization has been there for like about 14 years, 15 years when I was working there. So like I built like so building it, building new things, creating like exciting stuff that happened um, and like interactions between people and kind of understand like how things work. People interaction was very important um, for me to like see. So, I, so these are these are the ways how it was so cool. Like it was just so much fun, like working there. I loved spending so much time there, and there were so many different kinds of people. Like it's such a diverse team, diverse company, um, and and I adjusted so well. I was I was accepted among them. Um, it was it was equal, like. You know, like people were accepting of me as much as I was accept- uh, accepting of them. And it was such a harmonious relationship there. We had so much fun. So I, I made some amazing friendships there, amazing mentors. So, yeah, that was that was the best part about like that. Those are the kind of innovations that I was actually talking about. Like, you know, you're not just like stuck to like working paperwork. Of course, there those things were there. We had to do. A lot of policy maintaining, uh, a lot of paperwork stuff, like attendance, blah, blah, blah. But apart from that, like 80% of the work was like managing these things. And then I was also doing the CSR management, uh, the CSR component of the organization. So finding out social businesses or like NGOs that we could like work with, uh, where we could engage our employees to contribute their hours and their skills Um in a way that they felt very rewarding. So that was also part of HR. That's, that's what I thought that like, you know, I'm being able to like connect people to stuff that they're more passionate about. Like you get bored of the work that you do at a point. So you got to be able to like, you know, do stuff that is self rewarding. Um, and there's so many talented people, you know, like they're doing like um, website development or like desktop publishing work. Like some of them are like kind of boring, like it's, it's repetitive work, which is fine. But then they're, they're artists themselves. Like most of them are from like art college, you know, the art universities in Dhaka. Some of them are great musicians, great photographers. Um, and I, and so, so part of my work was to like find out people's talents and see where I could like, you know, what they wanted to do with it. Like apart from just work, like extracurricular stuff. So, um, and then like bridging them with like different organizations. I, I develop, so I used to like, develop a uh, like uh, CSR curriculum that we worked with um, where you know I, I did the entire management of the programs as well like what are we going to be doing how are you going to be executed like the entire implementation program processes and stuff so it was just so exciting like yeah like you think of HR you never and then I think of all of these things that are possible within that perimeter so yeah that's what I did <laughs> that's so cool you were a bit like the chief happiness officer <laughs> well, like, you know, sticking. Thank you so much. That's such a cool title. <laughs> no, I think it's so interesting. I'm, I'm actually, I'm really into. I mean, I would have never said I'm really into HR, but I'm really into, you know, looking at how you know companies work, especially, you know, how to make sure you know everyone has a voice, everyone feels empowered, everyone feels that they are doing something meaningful in a company, and. I think once you experience this, it stays with you all your life. Like you will never be able to come back. I mean, to go, to go to a company where they, you know, just are super traditional and stuff. You will just leave in like in two days. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I think another thing, you know, it's funny because, you know, I, even with me or Linka or many guests I interview, you know, what we do when we work with young people, for example, it's really mm-hmm. to help them, okay, discover what, you know, what cause, what, you know, challenges, issues they care about, what are their talents and how can they use their talents to contribute in, you know, working on the challenges that they care about. But I never really, I mean, I think it's very interesting in your case, it's the same thing, you know, in the end you said, I was here yeah. to find people's talent, unleash them. But you do it in the scale of the company, which I think is also very important. And yeah, uh, yeah, super pivotal for even the company itself, but also for the employees who come every day. And yeah, like, you know, back then during that time, did you see yourself? 
Because then, yeah, I, I will ask, obviously, like, what was the transition between this and, 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 and sustainable fashion? Uh, but maybe you found oh. your own talent. Uh, maybe you found your own talent by doing this. Um, but yeah, could you share a bit, like, what, how did you see yourself when you were doing there? I, I know that you did the master as well. Uh, at the end of your HR years. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, can you share a bit about the transition to Brooklyn? Yeah, sure. So the transition happened very slowly. Like, I think it was just like one thing after another, just like, you know, things coming together, but not quite yet. So I worked for like a very long time, about eight or nine years, I think, in the corporate sector. And then in 2017, I was like, you know, like I've been, so ever since like high school, I used to tutor. So like I've always had something or the other. Like, I was always involved with like something or the other. I'm never sitting idle. Even like I, I never took a gap year or like a break after my A-level, so, like before going to the university, like all of my friends like took a six month gap, right? So I did it. And I was just like, oh, I was working, 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 working. And just like one step after the another. And I just felt like I haven't talked things through. Like I haven't really planned ahead. I don't really know what I'm really good at or like what I'm, what I want to do. And that was really bugging me a lot. And in 2017, I did a small consultancy for this really big NGO here. I was heading their HR. It was a fantastic position. Like I switched from like uh, graphic people to there. Um, and it's just like, you know, like you're shifting from like a, a multinational company to an NGO, which is, which was a hard transition, which I thought I could manage, but I wasn't able because it's a massive culture shock in terms of like how things are done. They're so slow. I mean, they have their own ways of like working, so that's fine. And then I was like, you know what? I need to quit. Like I need to stop doing everything and just like running around like a headless chicken and find my passion. And I took a break for two years. And I was just like, you know what? I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to take my time. And I'm going to think about what I want to do. Um, it's important for me to like take that time and not feel like I'm wasting it. And that's when I kind of like started doing my master's by the end of it in environmental science and management. I thought like I, I saw the relevance and the necessity in it that I needed to kind of pursue that and understand that it was interesting always. Like science, I've, I've studied science in all of those as well. So. I feel like maybe that's the next transition. And then I started doing like environmental science and management and it just came together like right then. I was like, this is, this is what I needed to do. Like I, I was studying about like textile pollution and like how it's been aggravating. And like before that, as I was volunteered in during the 2013, like the Rana Plaza tragedy, that was always there that I wanted to work in the fashion industry and do something constructive where I could connect my art and the things that I wanted to do. So with the environmental science and management, it was, it was just like in sync. Like I, I was like, I know what I want to do. Like I wanted to work in the secondhand clothing, like re revamp the entire fashion industry and the model. And, and now I finally have the expertise to do that and, and the artistic knack for it as well. And that, that was the transition basically. That was, that was the pivotal point, 2017. Yeah. You know, when you took the break, what did you do to find your passion? Did you have any idea? I mean, you, you mentioned like you started to have first thoughts after the catastrophe with Reda Plaza. So is it something you explored during your break or like, did you do any specific things to, to explore all of that? No, that's a very good question. Actually, I had not explored anything in the fashion industry before that point. Before I started doing like broke, but I, I was just like looking into like brands that were taking place abroad. I was looking into like how the circular fashion was happening. And I just like tried to like kind of gauge back into like what we were doing as a family. And it was just spurred from the idea that I wanted to share that with people. I wanted to share that culture of like wearing second hand, swapping with friends and family. And feeling that nostalgic about wearing someone else's clothes and like learn their stories. It was more about that. 
than like going into the industry framework because I felt like that would come once I started working in it. So, so yeah, no, I had not explored like other avenues. Because yeah, like, you know, working with youth and especially these days, everyone is like, find your passion, find your passion. Or, I don't know what is my passion, you know, and you know, there's so many things about this, uh, you know, look for your ikigai or whatever. So yeah, just before we come back to broken stuff, uh, what would be, I don't know, advice since you've been through this as well for youth, you know, who are looking for their passion? I would say take the time, take the time to not feel angsty, like time is not running out. And I feel that was so pivotal for me to like understand that my time is with me. It's, it's not going anywhere. We need to stop chasing after things just because it's like, you know, other people are doing stuff or like they're getting ahead of us because everyone's like achieving so much right now. You know, it's that entire capitalist way of like looking into, looking into ourselves in the society that, oh my God, like, what am I doing? I need to be able to do this. I need to earn so much money. I need that social status. And I feel like those are not ideal indicators for like self-reward or in order to like accomplish your dreams and you're just like running after like very basic materialistic stuff. But if you're like, if you really want to do something that gives you meaning and purpose in life, I feel that we need to like take more control over our time and how we manage it and just like take a step back and just like chill, relax and map out what we want to do and what our inspirations are before it's too late. And before it's too late again, right? Like that's the entire ideology. It's, uh, it's such a nerve-wracking ideology. I feel that at any point of time, when you give yourself that moment to ponder about what your passion is, what you have gone through, what is happening around the world, and where you want to head to, I feel things will fall into places. And you really got to want to make a change or want to do the things you're passionate about. And that itself just adds so much energy. And I feel like things happen then, like when you're open towards things. So that would be my advice to the youth. Just like take a moment, chill, relax, think about what you want to do. Time is not running out. And it's really important to like figure out which direction we want to go to right now. Yeah. I mean, I wish I said that to myself, like when I was like 20 or like 25, you know. And did you start to have this mindset? Is it something you realized during the break? Is it something you realized as you were yeah. working? Exactly. Like this was when I took a break that I realized that, you know what? Like I'm just running. It's just like, I'm not thinking about things. Uh, I'm not calculated about things. Um, I know like a lot of youngsters are very aware now. They know exactly what they want to do, what they want to study. They have a very good career map which is brilliant. But then for the people who are not being able to like take that decision, I feel, yeah, like for me, it just happened like when I took that break. Like I, I just felt like um, I needed to just not think about anything. And that's like start from ground zero and give myself self that self-satisfaction like I needed to like feel like I, I I could own up to something you know which was not driven by like a job or something so yeah but yeah I really agree with you because whether it's in Bangladesh France Vietnam it's something which I think it's a universal <laughs> issue but yeah we never have time yeah. to pause and think we are always like okay I have to be in the best school I have to study hard to have the best grade yeah like until I have to have the highest salary more than my neighbor, I need to buy this and that, but never have time to really pause, think about everything you said. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> it makes me think about, you know, I was really, I really like Broke, uh, because it's not only, of course, there is the environmental part and the upcycling part, but I think it's much more than this Broke. There's so many things and you'll share much more than me from the social aspect, but also from a bit like philosophical. I, <laughs> but you know, from what I understand, one of your critique of fast fashion, it's, you know, it's the same thing, you know, you buy a piece of H&M, everyone has it, everyone in the world, but with Brocade, it's like sort of unique. Yeah. Uh, it's to celebrate your difference, 
which is something difficult exactly. to do, right? Uh, especially these days, we all want to be the same. But I feel like it really, you know, reflects well everything you said in Broke, beyond, you know, environmental, social stuff, but on the philosophical part. Yeah. So, Thank yeah, you. I'm glad you noticed that. Yeah, no, I mean, also, if, if we speak about uh, yourself as well, you know, you have, I don't know, I think last time I saw you, you had like blue hair. I think stalking you a lot, <laughs> tried a lot of different haircuts, you have very colored clothes. Um, so I would say, you know, you're very comfortable with, I don't know if it means being different, but at least, you know, asserting your style. I uh, just wonder, is it something mm -hmm. you were always comfortable with? Yeah, I think so. Definitely. Like, like I was very comfortable expressing myself the way I wanted to. And that was very important for me ever since I was a child. My my parents, and I think that has a lot to do with the autonomy that my parents gave me to choose what I wanted to represent the way that I wanted to see myself, regardless of my gender. Um, regardless of the societal expectations or like the norms and stuff, so um, yeah, it was it was it was always there, and I'm so grateful that my parents were able to support me through this, and it's because of them that I'm able to do these things, you know, like think freely the way I do right now. So they've been such a big support system, especially in this such a patriarchal society that we live in in Bangladesh as well. So yeah. Well, yeah, no, really, really love it. For me, it took time. You know, I, I have, uh, everyone knows me because I have very colorful clothes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Flashy yellow stuff. But I was not always like this, you know, back then I was like, uh, well, first I wasn't the one who was choosing my own clothes. <laughs> but then, yeah, I was, I remember the first time I put some colorful clothes, I was so stressed in the school. <laughs> <laughs> but actually no one no like standing one, out yeah exactly yeah. no one cares and people say it's quite cool but it's something for me it was something I needed to build like my confidence uh, yeah. but yeah no but like if, if we come back to Broke I think there's so many things that you can share about Broke like do you remember the first day when you had the idea of Broke I remember like, I was hanging up with my friend and I told her that yo you know, like I've been thinking so much stuff around me and I think I have a certain sense of like aesthetic and like styling. And I think I want to do this, you know, like I want to start um, curating like clothes, making like interesting styles out of it um, and start with that. And I kind of accept it from that day. Uh, we've been talking about it. I was like, yeah, I want to go around different places and see what's available. It's if like, you know, clothes are available ready or not or if I'm going to be collecting it for my friends or family. And, and it's just like, you know, like the one day I'm like doing like da -da -da -da, like a, a lot of brainstorming and just like finding things out. And it was like end of 2018 is when I started like brainstorming about it, like bits and pieces of LA, what I wanted to do. Mostly it was, it started off as a style that I wanted to curate and like style. And then like, you know, it started evolving into like stuff that we're doing right now. So, yeah. And yeah, how did you start your first, I don't know, upcycle clothes or collection? What was the first thing that you did to really kickstart Broke? Um, I started designing the stuff and I recruited uh, a master tailor. I started working with him. Um, he was also training me on the job. And then uh, we were undergoing like a lot of experimental projects and in between this, so they see what can we create like out of the second hand clothes that we collected so far. Um, so we created a few jackets, we created some jeans and like pants and like shirts and stuff. And from there, um, I, I got into like a design exchange program with the Guede Institute, which is a German institute in Bangladesh. So they have like a, it's called Local International. And, um, it's about like creating sustainable fashion design. So the, it, it's a program with like academics, researchers, designers, um, with like Berlin Art Institute uh, and like Fashion Design Institute. And it, it was such an interesting program. So like for four months, like met so many different kind of designers, NGOs, social businesses who were working like sustainable fashion. And that really helped me to like open up my mind as well. And the idea was 
to create your own line. And that's where the first collection kind of like, I did my, I, like I experimented my whole part. I did the things that I wanted to do. I created my first designs that were up in the exhibition. I haven't put that out in, in the commercial, uh, uh, commercially yet. But from there, like, I narrowed it down and into like, all right, so if I wanted to like take those concepts and kind of commercialize, um, basically like simplify what I, what I did for the project, simplified for, simplified for the first collection for Broke. And that's how the first thing happened. So the program ended in like August. Um, I started designing my first collection by September, October, actually October. And then by November we were done. And then we did the shoots in December or like January, I think. And then we started posting stuff. Like we started doing the branding. I did the website designing myself and then I just put it out. We created the e-course platform. And I think by January end or beginning of February, the first uh, cycle line of Pro was launched this year. And so maybe to, to understand better the process. So you have a whole design part, which is actually the first thing that you do. When they, like if you want to launch a collection and then like when you have the design, this is what will guide because it's upcycled, right? So you still, I mean, you need to collect textile waste or used clothes, but would you collect like, you know, anything that you can find or is it, does it depend on the design that you, you've done? It, I basically like, I, it's, it's more about like what I have at hand. And then I do the designs. So it has to be from that. So like, it depends on like what I have available in terms of like the fabrics and the colors and everything that I have. So I create like a mood chart, like like, from the available stuff that I have. And then from there, I funnel it into my design. And then I start sewing and like cutting and like making the the garments. So that's how it works. Okay. So you started with your own like fabrics, like in, in your house. Yeah, like I collected it. So like over the last two years, I've been collecting like second-hand clothes, garment surpluses from like different factories um, and, and the recycle market that's available in Bangladesh. Um, and then it was just like a lot of stock, but it has so much stock. So so from there, I, I condensed it to like a mood board that, okay, for so what it's going to be my color theme for this year, what are my inspirations? So it's mostly about like creating awareness on deforestation, river pollution, air production in like different specific areas of Bangladesh. So each garment kind of represented that ecological um, aesthetic um, or it's either that ecological aesthetic or the psychological, um, re- like the psychological process of like, you know, mass consumption that we're going into or like uh, the retro aesthetic, like how that came out because I'm a 90s child. So it's very much about like portraying the 90s aesthetics because that's what I grew up with and like connecting that with the, with the environmental aspects of it. So the, that process took a few months, as you mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. And it was expensive. Do you remember your first sale on the e-commerce platform? Yeah, it was one of my friends actually, like. One of my friends bought the first item and I was just like so happy to, to because, you know, it's a massive validation when your friends like it, you know, because you look up to them so much and grown up with them. You love their aesthetic styles and uh, styling and stuff. So um, it was really cool. It was one of my friends, I think, like bought some of my, one of the garments. I don't, I don't remember, I, maybe like a hoodie, something I don't remember quite yet, but it was, it was really exciting. Yeah, for me, it's super interesting to understand the process of your first collection when you, you know, publish uh, or sell this first collection. Like, what do you tell yourself? What is the next step? Are you satisfied with your first collection in terms of sales? Because you also need to, you know, test the market, try to see if you can live out of broke. Yeah, that's a very interesting question, actually. So I basically started producing the clothes and then like I put it up online. So on my website, so it's primarily like targeted through Facebook and like Instagram and like the website, right? And it was good. Like I got a very good, good response. Um, the first two months were really great. I think a lot of branding plays a major role in that. So that was interesting to like learn like what kind of marketing and like branding we're using. 
Um, and it was, it was a good response. Like I got better responses, like from abroad, which was a very interesting learning. Um, which was a very interesting learning because I thought like, you know, mm, I'd be able to like do more in the local market, but then I got a lot of orders from like Western markets, which was very interesting for me. So, which was like very interesting because I had a few friends like abroad, like even like, uh, like people that I didn't know, like from different countries, like from Sweden and then like Australia. Um, we got some orders from like Canada, which was very, very interesting. Um, like, and it happened through like Instagram, like people found out about it and like, uh, word of mouth marketing, like helped a lot as well. So, so it's a good response for sure. And I feel like if, and, um, but one issue was that, um, I launched the winter wear, like right when the winter was ending, because like there were a few difficulties, like during the production end and like the branding end, like, um, the campaign that I was doing took a little bit of time in terms of like gathering the photographs and like doing, um, the storytelling aspect. So. I, like my process of like I take things very slowly and like I want to make sure like I'm doing things right and like it needs to feel good um and which is why like it pushed out a little late like I wish like if I had started like from say like December it would have been perfect so like because it was pretty hot by the end of January like and we were entering into like spring and spring in Bangladesh right now due to climate change is hot like it's summer it's it's not like super chill you know so like the temperature is like it would just like shoot up um to like 28 to like 30 degrees even like on spring um so that was an issue um which is why i think that the local market was difficult to like manage because we're just in a different season altogether um and that's why the international markets were still um viable because they were still in like you know uh like the winter was still there so so that was an interesting learning. Yeah, it's so interesting. I mean, I mean, I think I have so many questions from, uh, from what you just said. But if we Sorry. let let let's maybe focus on the Instagram part. I find it very intriguing. Sorry. You know, you are a new brand. I guess you just created mm. the Instagram page. Yeah. And just you know, like this, you managed to sell to Canada, to like Sweden. Like, I wonder what is the secret or. <laughs> Hong Kong, you know, you just open an Instagram page and just like this, you know, it's something yeah. you launch an Instagram page and sell locally, but you, you even sell like pretty much all around the world. So, you know, what's the secret? <laughs> the secret is word of mouth. Uh, the secret is like, I got very lucky with a couple of friends that I have like in different parts of the world. Um, and some people who later became friends through Broke. So that really helped. Um, they were very intrigued with like something that, um, the Bangladeshi, it was a Bangladeshi brand. So it was cool for my friends. Um, and the, and the clients were abroad that like, Oh my God, like, you know, it, this is the first Bangladeshi brand, which is doing a streetwear label and it's, and they found it interesting and they recommended it to their friend and, uh, that kind of like spun off um like sales a little bit so it was definitely that word of mouth that helped with the branding aspects of from the instagram page yeah um because so because i do like organic marketing um i have only probably like boosted like one or two posts so far and that's it like and that too like this year well like one of the items that i made that was it Otherwise, it's just been like very organic marketing for me um, because I've been like always very torn about like digital marketing like in terms of like promoting uh, through through the say, Facebook or like Instagram campaigns and stuff. Um, one thing, because I believed that um, it's about attracting the right kind of people who 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 are looking for something like this and who would resonate with the brand philosophy. So I don't want, I didn't want like unwanted attention or like, um, I, like it sounds funny or like sounds very, uh, I don't know. Might sound, people might take it wrong, but that's not the idea. The idea is that, um, you get a lot of unwanted attention and that kind of, it, it, it hampers the brand negatively. So I'm very particular about, about that. So, but, 
I feel that it's very necessary to get into digital marketing, but it needs to be done right. That's where I am right now. Like I'm learning. Hmm. I, I didn't expect you to say like word of mouth, you know, like when, <laughs> I don't know, you know, the classic traditional things you hear when, you know, you just Google like, you know, how to, know, <laughs> how, how, you know, how to you know. like build a brand on Instagram. They will tell you, yeah, just find this hashtag, this hashtag or whatever. But I think, yeah, I think the, on the branding side, like, yeah, this brand from Bangladesh doing cool upcycling stuff. It's already something in itself, uh, makes people curious. At the same time, you mentioned, yeah, you have, I mean, obviously good photos of your products, beautiful products as well, which helps. Thank you. And maybe to, I mean, contextualize a bit before, I mean, so many things I want to speak about with broke. First, I realized you don't say broke, but. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, bro, I, I, I was very happy when I came up with the name. So. That's what's very interesting about Broke. Like it's like bits and pieces spread across like over the last 10 years that kind of came together one after the other. So it, it's actually inspired by this um this TV show that I was watching a couple of years back. It's a super interesting show. It's called uh, Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt, which was on Netflix. And so one of the characters over there was very flamboyant, very interesting. So like he has a very um broke lifestyle like he's broke he's like you know going by the bare minimum he's always looking for like small gigs and like jobs and stuff and um and so like and he's very fashionable at the same time as well so his ideology was um you know i'm broke but i'm classy and they spelled the broke with q u e and i was like hey that's that's really cool and i completely vibe with that because um that's that's kind of my philosophy as well and how do you explain the French E? <laughs> yeah, the French accent, right? Which makes it so classy because you're like, oh, it's broke. Like, um, it's uh, the idea is that uh, in the Urban Dictionary, it basically says broke is a person who's very loyal, um, very caring, very kind. Um, is going to be there for your friends or, or you know, it's, it's that kind of a personality that the character instills. And which is exactly what I feel that bro communicates as well, is about as well, that it cares about the environment. It cares about the people and the stories of the garments and uh, everyone that's involved. Uh, and so that's one. And the other meaning is basically that, you know, like being able to like style yourself with the, with what you have, that like you don't need to spend so much, like you don't need to spend luxury amount of goods or like money in order to make yourself look good like if you have the aesthetic if you have the sense like you can just shop from your wardrobe and and that's where the narrative kind of came in like all the shopping from my wardrobe was something that i attached to the meaning that already existed um in the year so it's more about just like you know like i'm fashionably broke you know like i'm, I'm fashionable and i'm I, I can make myself look good with whatever i have so it's like basically coming up with like my own styling agendas uh, and mantras like from my own wardrobe um and that takes a lot of creativity as well from from people um because and you get to have so much fun because you're creating so many cool, cool styles or stuff that you've had for like years that you haven't thought about before right so why do you really need to buy something new anyway and everything just like kind of came together with this philosophy that this name means so much like it, it communicates every aspect of what i look and broke for so yeah <laughs> oh that's super cool and and i've read somewhere that you also mentioned like that your design it's for all body types all gender i think it's gender neutral right it's a gender inclusive brand and Bangladesh has never had that and i'm very happy that I've been able to introduce that because as growing up, it's been difficult. Like Bangladeshi, like in terms of like access to like clothes in Bangladesh market, like even though we are the second largest manufacturer of the world, we're producing garments for like Zara, we're doing it for H&M, 
mango and levi's and like so many other stuff but like all the cool stuff like goes to like the export markets right so we don't necessarily get access to like very cool garments here which means that you're essentially like importing stuff from abroad that's one issue and the other one is that um growing up like the size fit has always been an issue. Like the variety of stuff that I wanted to like express myself with has been very limited. And that's where things kind of started to come in because of the way I identify myself. Um, I identify as a non-binary person. So I go by the pronouns like she and them. And uh, for me, it's really important to be able to harness that identity the way that I want to, which can be so fluid. Uh, I see that gender is such a fluid spectrum. Like it's on a spectrum. Like gender is not binary. Like it's not just male or just female. I feel like a male can feel feminine sometimes. He can feel masculine. And it's about your mood, like how you feel at that point of time. And why won't you want to express yourself for that moment or how you're feeling in that mood and then capture that mood. So Brooke's very moody in that sense. Like I, I want to, I want to be able to like express myself and the clients that I'm working with or, or basically empower the youth and the younger generation, the Gen Z and like the audience that I cater to, to be able to express themselves without holding any reservation through the clothes that I'm creating from Brooke because, because it, it, it communicates that gender neutral aesthetic. So. Um, for a girl or a boy or for whatever identity that people identify themselves with, I feel that um, the like, brands need to be able like to cater to those people, you know, um, and help, not help, but like empower, or, like just like give people options to like dress the way they want. Um, it's just so liberating because in terms of being gender neutral, the idea is that you get to explore so many sides of yourself, your mood, your personality. Um, and it's not restricted. Um, there's no restrictions and clothing shouldn't have restrictions. But um, we've always seen that, you know, like in any context, like it's a very white patriarchy that has kind of created these notions of how women should look. Very petite, very fragile, very, you know, voluptuous in certain ways. Uh, needs to be able to show the curves in a certain way. Whereas a man has been like from the early 19th century, like these kind of indoctrines have been like kind of taking on brainwashing people through like media, through stories, through descriptions and like um, and all of these communication channels that it shaped the way we perceive a man and a woman. A man is very masculine. A, a, a perfect man has broad shoulders. Like they're defined by the characteristics of an armor of the early of the early ages like from the it's inspired by the greek times right like how people had like how they were portrayed like you know like the v-shape for the man so that they need to be like very broad strong like all of these words that they associate with like masculinity these were brainwashed into like fashion these were like i feel that like when you when you look into like indigenous um styling or like tribal styling that they're very gender neutral like they wear what they want um they have their own aesthetic then they're they're very unique um like they don't assert um what do you call it i mean like there's no biasness in in how they perceive things and we have kind of like through colonization through western civilization it's kind of like been brainwashed into like looking at white portraits or like you know the whole imagery that the white male or the white woman portrayed in a certain way is what is beautiful in the connotations of beauty have been brainwashed into our minds and we can't unsee it or like unhear it or unlearn it it's very difficult like and even with like any kind of advertising and marketing we're always kind of like try to portray that um and so so i want to kind of break those stereotypes you know like i think it's high time and it's been ha it's it's happening now like globally there's a revolution in in sense of like accepting like the lgbtq community um and talking about um gender inclusiveness and like how important fashion is that in 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 expressing those identity because that's the first thing you look at yourself it's such an empowering tool so 
how we dress is how we feel is what I think. And that's, that's the idea that Broke is working with to break those stereotypes, to, to just chill and just like wear what we want. Uh, like if I want to wear like pants, I should be able to wear pants. If a guy wants to wear skirts, he should be able to wear skirts, whatever pronouns we use, um, whatever identities we use, like it should, it should be accepted. Like I don't, I, I don't understand like why there are so many restrictions, like why people go like, no, you can't dress that way. You're supposed to be dressing this way. So where does the supposed that restrictions come from? Like, how does that happen? So it's interesting. Like, you go deeper and deeper into, like, history and, like, uh, in terms of, like, fashion and like, identity and, like, all of these things. And you learn so much prejudice that we carry. And I just want to break those and uh, just create a very, very chilled out environment <laughs> with broke. No, but it's super interesting because I think on this aspect, it's as if, okay, how to... You know, remove all the brainwash that has happened mm. over centuries, our yeah. identity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I, see, I feel like you know, uh, this is like social cultural aspect of broke. So beautiful to see how it's also this broke is a is also the story of your life <laughs> through like all <laughs> the messages that you carry with. Yeah. You. But if we look at, it reminds me of what you said in the beginning, right? Like you know your grandparents they were you know, exchanging clothes and stuff you know it's like mm -hmm. what you also highlight and emphasize in, the, in like slow fashion movement i feel like as well it's what you mentioned in the panel like you know you were like in bangladesh or everyone in the world we were like fast fashion is super new and it's not something we cared about until recently and in bangladesh even more it's like you share a lot about like indigenous or more traditional ways of, you know, producing all the traditional clothes of Bangladesh that, you know, long time before. And I feel like, you know, you are trying to close the loop with Brooke, like coming back, you know, break the stereotypes, coming back to a more sustainable way of either identify yourself, or also producing clothes. Um, Am I saying random stuff or does it make sense? Oh, no, no, absolutely. <laughs> Not at all random. Uh, like, you're, you're right. There's so many angles to it, actually. Like, which is what's very interesting. Like, which is what excites me a lot about Broke as well. That it's just not about a garment. It's about, like, you're right. Like, it's about so many aspects of my childhood. And essentially, that's what I want to pass on. That's the legacy that I want to, you know, share with the people stuff that I have experienced and I feel like there's so many other people out there who have had similar experiences or are going through something similar and it's just being able to like you know identify with one another and relate and uh, be able to create that inclusive environment and uh, work together and like unite through sharing garments with each other you know it's, it's a very it's a very beautiful I look at it as a very beautiful way of like exchange and something I, I'm noticing while you spoke about you know, all of this identity and the cultural aspect, it's not really something that we can guess from, you know, your title as sustainability scientist and zero waste designer. Is it, I don't know, is it on purpose or is it another fight that you have, but you prefer to speak about more like the zero waste side of your advocacy? Mm, that's very interesting. Uh, I feel like <laughs> there's so many things. Um, yeah, I think the environmental aspect was, uh, was something that I prioritized a lot more. So that's why I think that zero waste and the sustainability scientist always comes first. Um, but that doesn't mean that the social aspects or the gender equality aspects are second. But I guess, um, like the title needs to change. I think that's what that, and it's a good, good conversation with you though, because you're, you're kind of helping me to like open up my mind in like certain ways that I haven't thought about it, that you're, you're right. Like I need to come up with something that is more inclusive of the things that I'm doing. So it's kind of communicate this thing. So I guess I'll, I'll give it some thought and like think. Thing. Like, or if you have any suggestions, I'm now totally open to like hearing that. Oh, uh, 
Well, <laughs> something which should be at the same level as sustainability scientists and zero waste designer is quite cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I mean, uh, let me know when you found your third uh, title, <laughs> then we have yeah. three things. Uh, but yeah, maybe to come back on the environmental aspect, because you mentioned as well, you know, in Bangladesh to have cool clothes, you need to import them, which is a bit ironical because you said like Bangladesh is the second biggest yeah. producer of garments. Maybe could you explain a bit about what mission do you have in terms of environmental sustainability in the fashion industry? You mentioned the Rana Plaza, but yeah, like fast fashion has so much consequences. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so I mean, a couple of goals, right? Like, I mean, so one thing that I started off with, like, is the fact that bringing attention into the adverse impacts of industrialization, um, bringing attention into the quality of life that the employees or the garments workers are going through while they're working in these industries, like whether or not they're empowered properly, given proper healthcare access, uh, are they treated equally? Are they given the right kind of wage or not? You know, all of these issues. So every time I talk about bro, like those things comes in hand. And those are the social aspects uh, of, of that. In terms of the environmental goals that I have is, is uh, primarily like in the, like reducing the water consumption, like saving water um, and water conservation is, is the top most priority for bro. It's insane, like how much water we use up, not just in the production process, like starting from the cultivation of fatten to making the yarn, to dyeing them, to turning them into the fabric, then again, dyeing them, post-washing uh, after the cuts are done. There's so many angles, like so many times that water is being used, um, especially like when it comes to like dyeing and like stuff, like we use like really bad toxic chemicals which are washed out none of these are like highly regulated factories so like they're all washed out into the river streams nearby river streams which affects the agriculture around the community which means like starting from the aquatic ecosystem to the animal ecosystem to the people ecosystem like everything is affected and everything is like interlinked like we all know and all of these changes or the impacts are very slow to see. Like some of the people won't even know like why they're getting sick or like why the, um, why the animals are like behaving in such a way or the fishes are dying in the pond. Um, water is drying up. They're clogging up because of so much, uh, effluent in the water, which is like clogging it up. Right. Um, and then so we're losing like water systems over here. Like Bangladesh has over 700 small to large river streams. Right. So. We are one of the largest delta in the world. We are in a position, we have, we have been a river, we, ha we are a country of rivers. Given that, we've lost about like almost six rivers by now around Taka, which is very concerning. And, and there's very little attention being paid to that. Um, and most of these river streams are big. They, they provide access to agriculture, fishery drinking, cooking, livelihood necessities for people who are living around it, providing water for like almost 18 million people who live around Takas. And it's a growing population. We're, we're a growing population. So, and pretty soon we're going to get into a water crisis situation. It's not going to be nice. It's going to be super ugly. There are already areas in, around Bangladesh where people don't have access to steady, fresh water all the time, which means people have to stand in line. They have to go. Women in like rural areas would have to like go or like in town areas that have to like, you know, travel from their house to like the water access, which is like pretty far away from like 20 minutes to 30 minutes walk. And it's not safe, but it's not just about water. Do you see like how much everything is like interconnected? So there's health repercussions, there's safety repercussions for women who are harassed while they're going to like, you know, collect the water from the safe, from the water port or like the areas where the water is circulated so maybe like just they get access to like 10 liters of water or like a bucket of water which has like 30 liters for say like 10 to 12 people but that's insane because uh that's not enough like for an average human being like i think you need about i forget the number of liters of water that a person needs a day uh, which is assigned by who 
which is not 30 liters. It's much more than I think it's around 120 liters or something around like ballpark of that. Um, I might be a little off of the mark. But if that's such a high amount is what we need on a day basis. So we need to start thinking about like how like every garment, say like, for example, a T-shirt that we make requires about 2,700 liters of water is a very common example that I always give. A pair of jeans requires about 10,000 liters of water just to make them starting from the cotton production to like till the end of uh, uh, dyeing and like processing and stuff which is huge because 2,700 liters of water is equivalent to like one person's drinking water for three years. And if we're constantly buying t-shirts throughout the year, so imagine how many people's water like you're, you're messing up, like you're taking away from the access, from the nature's resources. And none of these waters, like which are coming out from the factory, very little are being processed to, uh, you know, like they're they're not treated, which means like they're still carrying all the chemicals and stuff, and just like directly put back into the put back into the community without uh, like having been taxed for it, because you know they these to like bribe people, and it's everywhere. Like this thing is, it's a very common practice everywhere. I think, um, kind of bypass the regulations and stuff. So, so for me, it's really, really, really important that I focus on the water consumption and everything is tied around that. All the storage tied around that, like how much water we've really been able to like save from like every garment that is swapped, every garment that is made from rope, because ideally you're just like completely displacing the entire need of manufacturing new fabric. So that's gone out of the equation. And then you're left with the post-consumption water um, usage, right? And, uh, Mostly for these like t-shirt, like jeans fabrics, they require a lot of water to wash them as well. And um, especially if they're like polyester based or like plastic based fabric, um, you're releasing microplastics into the water system, which is really, really bad for the for, for us eventually and for the ecosystem as well, because it's all washed up together. Uh, like the fish and everything, like they're digesting all these microplastics, right? Like, and, and in turn, like the humans are consuming these, uh, produce like the natural stuff and it's affecting everybody, which is why the health and the health diseases are like increasing exponentially. Cancers are going up. Um, and these are very slow changes, like obviously not that rapid. So it's difficult for people to empathize with the problems that are happening right now, unless it was something like very major, like that, like the COVID or something like that. So the water impact is, is, very critical for for broke so that's what i want to make sure like we're able to save as much water as possible in the community so that we're we're not affecting like the mass people by like removing their access to water and therefore like ensuring that their quality like their quality of life is restored in a certain way that they don't have to suffer with the water crisis so yeah it's crazy because I mean, starting with the water issue of the fashion industry, it's like a string that you pull. And it's like, you just mentioned so many different issues from <laughs> water pollution yeah. and health. Like, it's like never ending. Uh, and the thing is, in, in terms of fashion, I mean, you mentioned microplastic, but you could even continue, you know, like all the greenhouse gas emissions, all you know, the working conditions that you mentioned a little bit. I mean, yeah, there's so many, so many issues in fashion industry. Uh, yeah, and it's scary to see everything that comes from the water yeah. Uh, usage. Yeah, because so another issue, like, for example, like, you know, so all these garments manufacturers, like the neighbors, uh, the, the, the workers which are employed, right? They live in such horrible living conditions, like in such small square foot areas that they live in. They barely have access to like, you know, like they're going through that problem of like water crisis already because um, they either live in like urban slums um, and like communities where like there are thousands of people with like maybe say like two bathrooms at the end of the day or like one water system for like 200 people, 500 people or like something like that. It's crazy. Like in the, in the urban slums and most of these people are just living there. Um so at the end, the people who are making these things are affected so negatively and their quality of life is deteriorating exponentially and people are not acknowledging that. 
we go like, yeah, but they're earning a certain wage. Like, you know, so what would you rather have? Like, not have these industries in place and like not have them work and they would starve. So it's not better that they have a job and they have a bare minimum life and going on about it. And then it's very tricky, right? I mean, just because you give a person like a bare minimum wage, which is not even like enough to like survive properly on a day to day basis because standard of living is so high. And then you look into these things, like, and then you're like, shouldn't it be better? Like, shouldn't there be conversations about making it better? Why are we accepting it the way it is? Just because, just because there is an employment in place doesn't mean it's good. It needs to be better. And that's the argument here with Broke that the fast fashion industry needs to do better in terms of treating their people. In terms of making sure like they have a healthy life, a fulfilling life. What I really love about Proc is not only you have your, your collection of clothes, whether it's a collection or whether I think you do bespoke clothing as well. So people can send you whatever clothes they want to upcycle, then you upcycle it depending on what they are, like what they want. But you also do a lot of advocacy work, whether it's You know, the workshops where people can come in and just learn the basic of reusing and upcycling clothes. As mentioned, you do a lot of exhibitions, a lot of art, video, writing a lot. And yeah, could you share like, how did you, you know, start with this first collection doing all of that? Advocacy has been such an important part because I feel like the work that I'm doing, like, Advocacy is a top priority. Um, without it, broke is just another fashion brand. And that's not what it is. Like it's, it's a lifestyle. Broke is a lifestyle. It's an ethical, it's an idealistic lifestyle that I want to communicate with people and share with people. I mean, encourage people to like, you know, jump on the wagon for it. It kind of, I think like when I think about broke, because of the lifestyle aspects to it, I feel that When you do workshops, you get acts, you, you're able to like communicate, getting to know these people better, people who are participating in these workshops. Um, you form a relationship and a bond. And that's so important. And that's where the connections are made. And every connection is valuable. Um, and without these human connections, like you can't really go forward. So at the end of the day, it's with the people. It's the people that, who are able to advocate for change and implement the changes. Um, and that's why like the workshops kind of came about that I started first time, I think uh, it was 2019 where I participated in a open fair and an exhibition where I exhibited ropes like second out of clothes and some of the upcycle garments that I uh, did. And from there, like, I know it started the conversation that, oh, Acha Broke exists, you know, oh, so we do this. And then from that, one or two months later, there was a clothes swap that I organized uh, with a upcycling, uh, with a recycling workshop, actually, where we recycled um, plastic bottles. Very basic, but like a really fun workshop. Um, and we turned those plastic bottles into garden pots. So like plant pots. Um, and we got, and so participants got to go home with like very beautiful, like very interesting, like flowering plants or like ferns that they paid for. Um, and it was so cool, uh, because we talked about, so while during the workshop, we talked about what broke was, uh, what second hand meant to us, like why we're exchanging certain clothes. Everybody who came in with their own clothes, like kind of, we encouraged that circle of conversation. And once you understand, once you form those relationships, you feel more connected to those garments for some reason, right? Like the, and that's the whole idea, creating that platform where people can just come in and like chill, explore their creativity. They're, they're making something really cool, which is also functional. They're going home with the plan. They're going home with the second hand clothes that they have swapped. And that's where it kind of started. And it felt so good. To be able to like create that space, we did it at we did it at one of my friends' house. He sponsored the space. Um, we did it on a rooftop, like during the evening. It was really nice, super chill. We had music, we had food. Um, it was just such a 
is such a fun environment. And I really miss that because because of the pandemic, like I'm not being able to do any for, uh, clothes swaps like physically. But we did a few like online clothes swap, which went on for like three hours. And we had like bidding war on like clothes, which was like unimaginable. Um, especially because like A, it's a clothes swap. B, it's online. C, none of us knew each other. Uh, so, so many different parameters, but it just worked so well. And I'm so happy and we're still in touch. There's about 20 people who participated. Um, we have a great, we still keep in touch, which is really cool. Uh, you know, you form these relationships and, and you're able to like learn like what they want, what they want to do and to work with those demands or like work with those needs in terms of like designing these workshops as well so like then i do a lot of workshops with get the institute the german institute in bangladesh has been very integral for like for that supported me so much um in terms of pushing my boundaries and exploring um all of these avenues right like we did some workshops for like jago um a couple of like inter-school students we did it for um U lab students like university students where we did like a natural dye workshop online um together which was phenomenal we're, we're doing some upcycling workshops recently like for some of their members and stuff so like you know like it's it's the stakeholders that you also connect to like some of these community partners which played a major role in making uh these ideas real and it's been just such a fun experience ever since so yeah that's how it kind of came about what is your big dream with broke like one <laughs> event or one thing i'm sure you have a crazy idea in your head yeah man like i want to do like a wacky wacky fashion show um for broke um to to kind of create that ambiance of uh of that identity gap uh and like kind of explore that so like that's that's still in like inception i don't know if i'm ever going to be able to do it like given the pandemic and the situation um but hopefully one day do some really wacky uh after shows but apart from that the big dream for broke is uh have broke chapters like globally um, like in, in the fashion centrals of the world, like Berlin, New York, um, London, these are really important spaces for like, for like kind of work with. So it's kind of working towards that. So I'm like looking for opportunities that would like kind of create that leverage and that partnership between these people, between these spaces and, uh, and make the broke, broke philosophy much louder. So that's, that's the dream. That's the big dream. Nice. If anyone has experience in fashion shows, please contact Mahinas. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Please let me know if we can work together or do something fun. I, yeah. In your whole journey, you know, when reflecting about it, you know, you, I don't know, you launched a first, um, how you call it, upcycle fashion label and textile recycling innovation lab of Bangladesh. You... Uh, you know, launch a first collection mm -hmm. of a site called Clothes and you pretty much don't have experience doing that before. But everything sounds so easy. Was it that easy doing all of this? Yeah. Well, it's definitely not easy. Uh, but I think it's how you, how you would want to look at it. Um, I mean, nothing's really easy, you know, at the end of the day, you got to put in that hard work. Um, you, you've got to put in your time. You got to put in those toem. And it's been interesting that way because um, it's such a small team. Like, uh, and um, self motivation is a very hard thing to do at the end of the day. Um, as, as, uh, as an entrepreneur, it's a very lonely journey. It can be a very lonely journey um, and a very daunting journey as well. But that's where the thrill is. Um, right, like you're you're creating something completely new here in Bangladesh, and uh, the possibilities are endless. Um, and that's what's exciting, I guess, is uh, just like keeping an eye open, like like you know, keeping myself open to new possibilities, um, and just like driving towards it. It's hard. It's it's really hard. Definitely hard. There's so many aspects to it, right? Like the social aspects, um, the limitations and the restriction, which I try not to like, you know dwell in so much at all i 
I try to look at it more positively. Like, it doesn't matter. Like, I'm going to do what I want to do. And that's all about it. It's about networking, right? Um, and all of that. And then, you know, um, as a as a designer, as a brand owner, like, the financial aspects are also very important. Like, especially with the COVID, it's been so challenging um, to kind of uh, see how every, everyone's been affected, right? Especially the small businesses, like myself, has been, like, very adversely affected. And it's about, like, how we pivot from that. And uh, hopefully we are pivoting from that and just try to be like really optimistic. So let's see. For me, I see Broke as, I, I, I love to see life as a funnel, especially, you know, when you work in youth empowerment, social entrepreneurship, there's, you know, there is an entrepreneurship journey. We also at UNDP, we have our idea of the youth empowerment funnel. But I think, you know, Broke, for me, I see it as, a, as you mentioned, a lifestyle, but also a funnel where you have everything from very simple entry points to things that people can take home and learn how to make their own clothes. They can buy clothes. And then they have a pure lifestyle, which is like you know, how to embrace this their whole life, which brings me as well to recently you share. I think you share that all the time as well. Uh, but yeah, about you, you just become ambassador for the slow fashion movement, right? So yeah, maybe related to that, could you share what is it? Um, so the slow fashion movement uh, is a Netherlands-based platform. It's an advocacy platform about um, the the impact of fast fashion and how people can adopt the slow fashion values and practices. So we do a lot of, we have so many chapters like across the world. Um, Bangladesh just started with me and uh, I'm, I'm working as the team lead for the most slow fashion Bangladesh and um, it's been very very interesting so it's a it's a really small team and it's about um, talking about the values of Bangladesh and um, creating that uh, like what is slow fashion in Bangladesh that is one and uh, so, so it's about like talking about so it's interesting because all of some of the advocacy parts that I wanted to cover and the broke. Now I'm being able to do that like through this platform, which has a much bigger audience and network, right? Um, I got to meet so many fantastic people who truly are practicing slow fashion. And I'm getting to learn so much from all of these like content makers, um, how they're going about how these advocacy. They're working with like NGOs, they're working with like fast fashion brands, like, you know, Posing like important questions, like how can we drive change, not just on a consumer level. Um, I mean, that's like seventy percent of the focus is to like focus on like how can we change like consumer behavior to transform them into like a slow fashion habit. Um, but also, oh, like the thirty percent of it is also like working with like different NGOs and like stakeholders, government level, uh, um, and like brands and stuff, like who and researchers and academics to like work in terms of like policy making or like asking the right kind of questions to like uh, on the manufacturing side so that there can be regulations in place and stuff. So it's, it's such a larger than life, like concept uh, platform. And, um, and like for Bangladesh is very exciting as well. Like we're, we just started um, recruiting some founder. We just started. Uh, so I designed some ideas around like uh, starting from the heritage of Bangladesh that goes back to like centuries, like very, very um, bite-sized information so that it's not too heavy. And I think the idea for me, like what I, I truly believe is that once people can connect to our history, like naturally, like when we learn about our history, when we learn about where we come from, um, we, we can empathize. We can empathize to like why we should be protecting what we have, why we should be protecting our environment, why should we be working towards climate change? Otherwise, if we don't know where we have come from or what our value has been, what is at stake, like we won't care about it. So, and I think that's, so that's the first phase of the slow fashion platform is that we're working on that ideology, connecting those historical um, components of Bangladesh and the Bengal, Bangladesh, because Bangladesh is part of the Bengal history, um, which goes back to colonization, which goes further back to the mobile era. Uh, and which goes back to like the um, Turkish uh, eras as well, like back 
and further back into like the Greek times as well. So like such a strong, incredibly heavy heritage that we have in terms of cotton production and like the textile heritage uh, where we have produced um, mandolin. So, and these things are like, you know, they're disappearing now. Like we stop producing mandolin in Bangladesh which used to be one of our thriving commodity like back in the day. We don't do that anymore. So so that's the thing. That's why we need to like focus on these things. Um and slow fashion and that slow fashion bottle is that uh, that's where we started off now. And hoping that we can connect to like more content makers, influencers to talk about the importance of Bangladesh's um, industrialization impacts and like kind of change that consumer behavior, hopefully. So that's the plan. What would you say to, let's say, I'm a citizen who cares about everything that you just said. Maybe what are some few things that I can do to educate myself on this fashion industry? And what are a few things that I can do in you know my daily life to take action on it? Very, very interesting question. Um, I think we need to start small. Like, I feel like that's where people get like very overwhelmed that, oh my God, um, where do we start? It's such a big issue. Um, but honestly, I feel like, like if we just start small, for example, like, you know, just get the account of like whatever number of clothes you have in your wardrobe, right? So we, we know exactly what we have. Then we don't, then we don't have to constantly buy new things. That could be one, like mapping your wardrobe, um, figuring out like styling, whatever it's like shopping from your wardrobe would be the next thing, like mix and matching, like whatever you have. And then if you have something really missing, like a functional item, you go and buy it. Like either you can, I mean, it's not just that you completely curb fast fashion. That's not the idea. The idea is that you change, you change your purchasing behavior in a more positive way where you're aware about why you're buying something and why you need it and what it means to you. So, I mean, like, say, like, I've always bought, like, fast fashion clothes before, um, like, when I've, when I've shopped, but I've kept them for so long. Like, I have clothes from, like, 15 years ago. I have clothes from, like, 10 years ago. And these are all fast fashion brands, right? But how I have managed to use it is what matters. That I, I have kept it well, I've maintained it well, I've washed it in a way so that it doesn't degrade the quality of the fabric. Um, so these are some of the things like post-consumer behavior, like with your clothes, or like uh, maintaining it properly. Like you don't need to wash your clothes so many times, um, you know, like using like cold water to like wash your clothes so that avoiding like washing machines because that, because washing machines uses tremendous amount of water and like electricity so there's a huge carbon footprint and a water wastage from like post consumption so just using like a basic you know like cold water like without washing machines like and drying it in the air could like save you so much carbon footprint and and it's such a simple practice that you can do right like and you start so small that's those are some of the things um another couple of things that could that you could do um is looking into like, you know, uh, your label, like, and knowing, like, what components your clothes are made of. Because then if it's made of, like, polyester, if it's made of cotton, you take care of it in a certain way. When you're giving it away or when you're throwing it, like, when you're giving it to charity organizations, so you're more cautious about, like, what's in your garment. Where is it made from? Um, each kind of fabric has a different post-consumer behavior like in terms of like washing and like maintaining and stuff so you can save so much carbon emission just through these like knowing better about your garment and the other one would be like you know studying about the brands that you're wearing um knowing about their practices like are they ethical or not are they paying their labors properly and on time uh, are they giving them health benefits or not? During the pandemic, have your did your brand pay up the wages? Have they like you know pulled back on the orders that they placed initially? Like Bangladesh was massively affected. India, Indonesia, Vietnam, Sri Lanka, like all of these countries have been like very adversely affected during this pandemic because none of the brands took ownership of the orders that were placed. They just fall. They just folded. Um, now. 
you know, so many garment factories have folded because of that, because they're like, we can't pay our workers because they're not going to buy the products anymore. We've made everything, but they don't want to get it. So then you got to know about your brands. Like, is your brand doing the right thing or not? And because the consumers have the biggest power at the end of the day. If we don't want to buy something, then the manufacturers won't make it at the end of the day. I mean, that's the idea. That's the dream. Um, so yeah, I think these, some of, some of these things you can just like start at home and it's very easy. Just a little bit of research. It's like taking that opportunity to like learn better about, um, your clothes and, and the brands that you buy from. Yeah, I love it. And I think it links to my last question about fashion industry is also, it's around greenwashing. You know, I, if I put myself in, you know, I, I don't know much of the brands. I will, you know, start researching on Google. I will find, you know, all the big brands. And obviously these days, all the big brands, they say that they are more eco-friendly. They will cut the carbon emissions. They treat their workers well. They, you know, they have good materials, et cetera, et cetera. So how to na navigate, you know, all of this? And how to understand, okay, which this brand is saying bullshit, this brand is, you know, doing great stuff. How, how to navigate all of that? Yeah, you know, I mean, this is such, such a important topic, um, very close to my heart. It's something that really bugs me a lot as well, because working in this industry, like when you have greenwashing companies, like raining all over the work that you're doing and confusing the people about wrong terminologies, wrong implications of the terms that we're trying to like advocate about. It's so difficult. Um, I mean, then again, at the end of the day, it's about consumers doing their due diligence in terms of their research, right? Like, I mean, a brand can claim that, hey, I'm, I'm doing this, you know, like I'm a sustainable brand. Uh, I'm using like 60% polyester and blah, 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 blah. Or like, you know, they have like different uh, stuff that they're saying, but Marketing on all of these brands have like huge marketing games, right? Like massive marketing budgeting. And it's so easy for them to um, constantly drill those ideas in your mind. So like, you know, I mean, that practice, like the marketing practice is very common where if you see something repeatedly a couple of times, like more than three times, you start believing it. Um, and then so how do you work around it, right? So the way you work around it is is basically like, following the brand you know like following them on their socials uh doing their it's a little bit of work but it's important to do that work that you're following their social handles you're reading about the articles uh, any articles that are printed about them you're going to their website you're looking into like what their practices are and you try to see and if it matches with what they're saying um and how much is it actually being able to like work, like keep up with those right i mean oftentimes you probably like end up buying the product and then you learn that it's not the way they have promised to but then by then it's too late because if you're buying it to like ten thousand consumers already that's already like ten thousand products sold you know so it's about taking that time before purchasing and like matching what they are promising to deliver matching it with their storytelling matching it with their brand promotions like Connecting the dots, it's so important. So I think that's the only way. Otherwise, it's difficult um, to like not fall for it, like um, assessing. Like, for example, there are so many great ethical and like, sustainable brands. When you go inside their website, you see the impact assessment. Um, you see the product descriptions and the photographs and like how they're working around it. Their history is so important. Like their work practices that they talk about, their company philosophies, um, the work ethos. Um, and they have like blogs and articles, um, photo references, videos that kind of adds value to everything that they're doing. So you have evidence. Everything needs to be like evidence based, right? Because with marketing and advertising, anything and anyone can say whatever and, um, and, and is able to like fool you. So, but you need evidence and you need to be able to like kind of take that decision that, all right, you know, you've got to ask them the right question. So like before you buy something from that brand, why don't we start asking questions, you know? Because maybe not every information is available on the internet. Like there are not enough evidence available about like new brands or like some brands that, who are claiming to like work in a certain way. So then 
you have Twitter, you have Instagram, you have Facebook, you have the customer call number, you you ask them the question that you need to know about, like, you know, how did you make this product? Where is this coming from? Where is the supply chain transparency? Like, um, where is it sourced from? Um, what are you doing in the back? Like, you know, like uh, the, the gender equality, the wage disparity, like how are you making these things, uh, like ensuring these practices? Um, what is your fabric made of? And then blah, blah, blah. Like, you know, so there's so many questions that you can ask before you buy a product. Um, and why not? If, if you're going to wear something, you should know what you're representing. Because ideally, you're representing that brand. It's not just your identity, but you're also um, communicating about that brand. So like, if you're putting it on your body, you're taking on a responsibility. And I think that's what people need to understand, that we have a responsibility towards the environment, towards the, towards the people, um, with what we choose to purchase, what we choose to buy. Because that's the statement we're making. There's a reason we're buying a brand is because that's the statement we choose to make that I'm buying Zara, I'm buying Balenciaga, I'm buying Broke is because it matches with a certain thing. Like it matches with a certain kind of personality that I want to communicate. So if you're making that statement, you got to know what that statement means or like constitutes to what kind of weightage it carries. Um, so, and you got to do your due diligence. You got to ask them the right questions. You got to find out for yourself and see. And and then you have your own set of benchmarks, right? Like for me, what are the things that I'm looking for? What are the things that would ascertain that this is the brand for me, right? So I could have like five different factors. For example, if I want like my products to be non-polyester based, I want them to be sourced, uh, like I want them to be made with like organic cotton certifications like do they have like certain certifications or not which justifies that these are made properly um in in the in the production process um and then like what kind of carbon footprint are they putting back like are they doing the, any assessment about their entire value chain you know like are are they even aware about like what is the impact of like every garment that they're making so if i find these four answers in a brand i will buy that product if these answers don't satisfy me, then I won't buy their product, you know, once I find these answers. So I think these are some of the ways definitely to like go about it. No, I think for me, it makes so much sense. And to yeah. go into the reports and, you know, do the due diligence. I, I can also understand that, you know, this research takes, I mean, time. And I, it just makes me wonder, like, how many people will be willing to do that? Uh, which yeah. makes me wonder again. Do you know if there is a simpler way to, I don't know, is there a trusted, I don't know, influencer website? Well, yeah, so there is this it. website. Um, I think it's for Ethical Compare. So it's it's the Ethical Compare platform. What it does is um, it lets you compare the ethical practices of a brand. So they have like all the information in the background. Um, you put in the brand and you, and, you, and you can start comparing like what are their carbon footprints? What is their impact? Um, what are their practices and stuff. So I think these kind of resource centers are really useful that people can use and like save time. Nice. It, it makes me think of there is a, there is an app in French, uh, which is only in French, unfortunately, but you just scan <laughs> like the barcodes of your clothes. Then it shows you a lot of data on social and environmental aspects. It's pretty, pretty cool. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool. I think it's only in French, but it's called, or you can check, it's called, Cle it has an English name, Clear Fashion. So they have, they have an app. They give a score, environmental score, human score, health score, animal score. Uh, they say what material is it made, how it was made, like all the materials, et cetera, et cetera. So it's pretty, pretty cool. It's a good first step to do some research. So, yeah, no, thank you so much. Uh, maybe as we are approaching the end, I have four questions uh, that I like to end with. So the first one is, through your life, when did you first realize that you could influence people? Oh, I always, <laughs> that's such a heavy question. I, I never assume it's something to answer because it's, it's, it's so different right now like you know with the whole influencer marketing and like the whole influencer game that's happening right now hmm that's an interesting question i don't i don't necessarily look at myself as an influencer in per, per se but um 
I guess I'd look at myself as more of a change maker. Um, and I, I understand like what your question means, but I guess I'm trying to like kind of clarify it in my head. Well, maybe if, if I rephrase it with a more positive word, when did you <laughs> first realize that you could inspire people? Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I think, uh, I hope I'm able to inspire people. That, that, that's the aim, that's the dream. Um, people I want to hope. create a fan club of you, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I, that was so reassuring. It was, it was such a beautiful feeling. Uh, I had no idea that it would inspire people in such a, in such a profound manner uh, on, on the conference that we were there earlier. Um, I, I think um, I have to put a time there. Uh, I think it's uh, it's it's about the time since I started working for Broke. So um, I think 2019. But before that, uh, like in terms of the public speaking aspect of myself, like I wanted to make myself useful in that sense. But I, I kind of so I used to work um, in terms of like um, creating platforms such as like so we had a chapter called Injury Entrepreneurs Taka. Um, which is a global chapter that we started in Texas for like a couple years back in 2015. We ran it for a year. Um, and it was the idea to like encourage people to like network with each other. So we will go to like a weekly networking session. And I think it kind of spurred from that. Um, I felt like I was making myself more useful to like create some positive impacts around people and like organizations that I knew. Um, I think around that time, maybe. Yeah. 2015, 2014, um, starting to get comfortable with the idea that uh, I, I can I can do something about problems and issues around me. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, for me, that's quite early. That's pretty good. Um, <laughs> cool. No, yeah, no, for me, it, it came, uh, I mean, uh, the short version is that it arrived much later, uh, probably in my early 20s. And yeah, so I think. Yeah, looking more at the future, uh, this is my uh, favorite question. How do you want people or do you hope people to know you for and remember you for? Oh, how do I want people to remember me? I want very, very interesting question. Think about it a little bit. Actually. Wait, give me some time. I need, I need to think about it a little bit. Um, yeah, yeah, no pressure. <laughs> I think definitely as the, as someone who has started the slow fashion movement in Bangladesh in, in the manner that I have, uh, someone who has started the legacy of like gender neutral conversations or gender inclusivity, uh, in terms of like fashion and climate. So like as a person who is, who's energetic about changing things around her for the better and for the good. I want people to hope and to know that it's possible to to make about a change if you're excited about it, if if you truly believe in it. Yeah, that's what I want to kind of instill that, you know, I, I want to be able, I want people to like remember me as that light that could help them feel like feel energetic and like inspired about making a change around them, that anything is possible. I think for me, it's really important as well to like kind of possibly remind myself that if I put my heart into something, if I really want something, I can make it happen. And I'm very lucky and you know, I'm very grateful to like everybody around me because it's happening in such a such a manner of time. Um yeah that like and, and I feel that like gender shouldn't play a role to like slow you down or like hold you back, especially in a in a society that we live in. Um you gotta look beyond your your weaknesses. You gotta look beyond the limitations that the society brings for you. And you gotta just like be very headstrong, looking like, forward with that excitement. Yeah, I think that's 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 what I want. I like hope. That's for a super cool answer. Do you do you, <laughs> do you think you are there already? Um. 
where people can see me in that light. I, I'm, I'm, ho- I'm getting there. I'm, I'm starting. At the, it's so new. I feel like there's so much more to do, and I've just started. Um, uh, there's so many more things that I want to do, and like so many more, so much impact that I want to create around me. Um, the scale is enormous, and uh, compared to that, like uh, I'm in completely like in a baby step right now. So. Play a long way to go, man. Long way to go. <laughs> How would you describe yourself in three hashtag? Three hashtag. Uh, it's interesting because I always on Instagram, I always use the hashtag in the void, which kind of resonates in the sense that we try to find purpose and meaning in in the void. Right? There's always that existential crisis that that is lingering and I feel that it's important to acknowledge that so that we can like overcome it so it's like definitely like empty joy um other two hashtags would be and as like I don't know energetic <laughs> like super energetic um and the other one would be I do it there. yeah pretty cool combination it's a void energetic idealistic yeah very contradicting as well <laughs> <laughs> energetically in the void I guess it makes sense and yeah final my final final question but yeah how can people support broke or just support you your advocacy uh, in general one way would be to clothes swap if you want to donate your clothes if you want to upcycle your clothes and not throw them away i would really request to let out throw away your clothes um, or trash them um, or if you have a small rip or like a tear or something like you don't need to replace it with the new garment like you can have it upcycled with me if you want if you want like design ideas to create some functional items with your old clothes let me know that's one way that i can that can support growth and the movement that we're working in terms of slow fashion um other things would be like if you have any academic or like research work that you're working on that you feel like would go hand in hand with like growth i'd love to be part of that and like um and like support like it, it could be like a collaborative support system that we can feed for each other um the other one, I guess, would be to collaborate on like the advocacy about so fashion, like the repercussions of fast fashion industry, of advocacy about the storytelling of like garments and stuff, so like environmentalism, the climate change. So these are certain ways that you can definitely support growth. Um, the conversation that we can create is what is going to support growth to move forward. Uh, and hopefully we're able to like exchange uh, close in the process <laughs> and adding that you can all go on broke website and also buy cream <laughs> yeah it's a good way to support Thank broke <laughs> so yeah buy broke support the people who are working uh, with every garment that you buy um, you're directly supporting the artisans that are making and creating the handicraft that goes into the design so yeah that's why we most crucial things um with the mask that you buy from broke uh we have a mask for mask campaign running which uh with every mask anyone buys um we donate the same mask to a marginal community member or the amount equal to that mask there to, to a uh, marginal community member so these are some of the ways so like uh, a purchase definitely goes a long way to support that system and yeah, broke delivers everyone in the world. I checked. Yeah. And I tried to. I tried to buy something. I will buy something. Oh, I, yeah. I'm just figuring out. Oh, I, oh. <laughs> no, Orin, let me know if I can help out in any way. Thank you so much for the support. No, no, of course. I mean, honestly, I really, really like the style. Even I'm, I'm not really into eighties, nineties stuff. But I really like the dual, uh-huh. dual colors on the sweaters. I think it's very. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, of course. So yeah, encouraging everyone go on broke website, buy some stuff. They deliver everywhere. Buy your mask in the process as well. And 
Thank you so much. I have <laughs> with all the <laughs> things that happened, I have no idea how long will be the episode. <laughs> But uh, yeah, it's 1 a.m. in Bangladesh. So thank you so much yes. for staying We're up. Good. I mean, what I notice is Bangladesh people stay up super late anyway. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> The later, the better. <laughs> to watch all the football games uh, of Argentina. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. But uh, yeah, no, thank you so much. It was a pleasure to have you. And yeah, looking forward to join your coming workshops. Oh, absolutely. I'll keep you guys posted. Um, I hope uh, we're going to organize something soon online. Let's see in a couple months. Um. And thank you so much for asking such amazing questions. It was it was really cool. I felt like I was going through a maze inside my head and trying to like understand myself better and like the brand itself as well. Like you, you posed some very interesting questions. I'm very happy that you did. It's definitely been a very, very amazing experience to like be able to share this conversation with you. Congrats for listening until the end of this episode. Of course, to best support Lifeline, you can share this episode to two of your friends and subscribe to the next episodes on any platform. See you next time.